This is PodKit, episode 56, on this side of the time warp, on Sunday, March 29th, 2020. And now, more bread. This episode of PodKit is hosted by Brandon Johnson, Brian Mitchell, and Ryan Rampersett. This episode has show notes at thenexus.tv slash pk56. Welcome, podkitters. Hey. How's it going? It's going all right. Uh, pretty typical Sunday for me, at least. Lounging around at home, doing podkit. You know, interneting. How about you all? Nice. Well, it's going pretty well. You know, it's it's warm these days. It's uh, currently raining instead of snowing. And there's um, a statewide shutdown. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Good, good to have some rain. Thun- first thunderstorm yesterday. Yeah, that was great. Love some rain. What's this I hear about a, a shutdown? Well, there's What's going on in the world? World uh, pandemic going on right now. I. It's kind of unfortunate. To say the least, it is a bummer. Yeah. Um. So how are, how are you guys doing during this global pandemic shutdown time? I've been working from home for two weeks now. Um, yeah, so we're recording this on the 29th of March, uh, which you probably heard in the title read before, so I might even edit this out. We shall nah, see right. how Leave I feel. In. Leave it in. <laughs> Leave it in. Fine. Um, anyway, so I started working from home on the 15th, which is kind of when my whole team did. Um, to me, my life is pretty similar except for the fact that i have more podcasts to cram through while i go on a walk or something i have no commute i still get online right at 9 9 a.m right in time for my meeting whereas when i would go into the office i would barely get to work by 9 a.m so you know similar thing Uh, i have a standing desk at home with a large monitor and a good stand and workspace so i'm pretty much adjusting well I'm, i'm glad to finally be using my desk office setup like full time because I certainly didn't quite use it enough, I feel, to justify the amount of stuff I have. But now I do, so we're good. That's excellent. How about you, Brandon? Uh, For me, it's been a little weird. Um, You know, I just essentially moved into a new office uh, in early February. And um, basically, uh, I had to, like, de-move or move out, I think is the phrase, uh, from, from that office in order to get all of the stuff that I usually expect in order to have a stable-ish workspace. Like, just as I set up a stable workspace at, at the new office, it was time to pack up and get out of there. So I've been um, basically indoors for almost three weeks now. It'll be three weeks on Wednesday, um, uh, which was kind of motivated by the pandemic, but was mostly motivated by the fact that um, uh, my allergies were really bad. So I just stayed inside because everyone was talking about pandemics and I was like, well, I don't really want to be sneezing while everybody's, you know, concerned about that stuff, even though that was, you know, almost a month ago now and everything we know about that has, uh, shifted somewhat and it's gotten a lot worse and a lot more present. So that's been kind of wild. Um, I was up with my family for first couple weeks. Um, and now I'm back here in beautiful historic downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, but, uh, aside from that, no, uh, a a lot of, a lot of things remain pretty, pretty similar. I've actually been way more efficient, um, because I haven't had to go anywhere to do my work. So like my number of billable hours or my like ratio of billable hours to, um, like hours spent, but in chair has increased significantly, which is like how I measure productivity. Um, cause like if I'm sitting in my chair and looking at Twitter or something like, uh, or if I'm wasting a lot of time switching between projects that annoys me and that reduces how much I can, um, get done and therefore how much I can bill. Right. Um, so that kind of sucks, but, um, now that that's improved, that's, that's been really quite nice. Um, and I think my clients are liking it too. Um, yeah, it's good to be back around. Um, I was drinking back when I was up in the suburbs, I was drinking like cold coffee, um, which is really good, like cold canned coffee, but it's nice to be back and like have a little bit more control over, um, some of that stuff so I can make hot coffee again and, you know, 
I made scones yesterday. I made bread this morning. The bread didn't turn out very well, but you know what? Um, I've got nothing but nothing but more days that I'm working from home. So nothing but more days to make more bread. More bread. How about you, Ryan? More bread. Yeah, I'm I'm doing pretty well. Um, our team has uh, always had remote team members, so like that's not been a big deal for us to adjust to. Uh, now we're just instead of being partially in the office, we're just all not in the office. Um, nice. And in fact, one of our team members actually moved to Ohio uh, mid last year to to work out down there, and you know they've been really lonely because like they only get meeting time during a meeting, like they only get to talk uh-huh. and chat and you know say hi and stuff. So we actually have a um, non business hours discord chat that we can just jump into whenever somebody wants to say hi or something um and it's just for anybody who's around or you know just wants to say hi so it sort of emulates the idea of having like an office with people in the office it's been fun yeah uh you know working from home was pretty fine um you know it's fun to hang out with the dog and watch it sleep yeah I've, i've struggled with um staying productive a bit um I find that um, when I depend on Slack and things for staying connected with people, I I am too much on Slack, and I am, you know, bouncing around helping people or looking at pull requests or or whatever it is, and um, or you know, FaceTiming with some coworkers or friends or something just to get some face time and social interaction in there. That like I my productive time is like four to six PM when everyone is going offline and I'm like, okay, now I can work. And then so it's it's led to evening work a little bit, but I don't know. We have a big release coming up with our app on April first, so Wednesday. So I've been trying to finish stuff up for that. But that's so interesting because it's been kind of the opposite for me. I have actually worked um less weird hours doing this new format because since everybody is actually not bothering me because they're not physically there and I can turn them off, like I can turn Discord yeah. or Teams or Slack off, um, people actually have to, like if they need me for a formal reason, schedule time, or ping me specifically for a specific reason, and that actually makes people think about it and write it down first. So my productivity time is between 9 and noon, and then I do all of like the admin tasks after. Mm-hmm. Afternoons are usually a little bit lighter in terms of stuff going on. Uh, most of my meetings are in the morning and things. So mornings mm-hmm. are more of my check in, maybe get an hour or two of work time in. But um, even even when I'm in the office, I usually either chime into some discussion on Slack around something that affects my team or something I care about, um, or people ping me directly with questions about stuff. So like we're already because the my work office is quite large. There's, you know, hundreds of people in development in seven different buildings. So we're already these cross team kind of depending on Slack and stuff for messaging. So mm-hmm. from that sense, it's kind of the same. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I think like one of the weirdest things for me is like the first week of this, um, I had like three hours of meetings a day, easy, like every day, nine to noon or, or 10 to one, uh, sometimes later was like check-ins with people. And that was really terrible because like, you know, so, so, you, uh, I've talked to some people, some contractors who feel like, oh, well, you know, like a meeting is kind of a double-edged sword because it's like, if you're, if you're a contractor, that's like an hour where you're talking to people rather than an hour where you're coding. So like, if, if that's how they want to spend your time and, and their money, then like, that's fine. But I, it, it like, there's kind of a tacit acknowledgement there that like meetings aren't really a great way to spend an hour of developer time, <laughs> right? Because it's like, uh, unless there's actual things to discuss that are, that are bearing on things, like just spending time on an update like that is something you should be able to get at any point from like a project management tool. Um, so I've tried to like pivot my clients who were early on very, very focused on spending half an hour to an hour every day on meetings um, to something that was a little bit more autonomous so that they can feel like they have a handle on what's going on without like requiring pulling me or other developers on the project out of, out of their workflow to do it. And that's been really nice. So like, I think last week I was down to like an hour a day of meetings, which is maybe still too much, but um, definitely, definitely felt better. Um, 
so I think like that meetings thing, as people learn more about how remote work can work, I think it's going to be different. It's going to be interesting to see what develops. So how are your how are your uh, families doing with all this? Are they re- remote working too? Uh, my sister is uh, a TV reporter and news anchor, so she's uh, I think she's anchoring in the office, but she's doing her reporting out, um, working kind of out of a car with a producer or photographer. I forget um, what their t- title is. Um, so more isolating than normal, but still going to the office a little bit. My parents are both in the medical field. So they both go into the office though. My mom is more, um, less medical essential. So she's been, uh, going around to different parts in the hospital complex doing different roles. Um, so it's a little more unsure of what her uh, role will be in all of this, but yeah, I'm, I'm the only like full remote avoiding all social interaction kind of stuff for my immediate family, at least. Yeah, my family was actually going to go on vacation. Um, not not with all of us, but just, just my parents were going to go on vacation. And so they took that first week and just, you know, clearly didn't go anywhere, but just used their vacation time for it. And then second week, um, basically both their employers uh, either canceled, you know, canceled work and told everyone to work from home or... Um, let them extend their vacation so it was it was pretty pretty easy in that front and then um basically by the end of that second week everyone was either working from home uh or um work had stopped for them so um it's you know definitely grateful for that because you don't want people being out and about unless they're doing something truly important so yeah it's kind of it's kind of weird though. It's kind of weird because the shelter in place order just took effect like yesterday morning at 12.01 AM. Yeah. And yet for almost everybody I know, shelter in place has been basically the de facto standard yep. for weeks. Yeah. I also saw something, I don't remember the source, so don't necessarily quote me on this. Um, Minnesota, like a huge proportion of the total jobs are deemed essential, like yep. some uh-huh. 80% or something. So there are quite a lot of people still going out and stuff, but I think many can do some of that essential work from home. Like my yeah. company, for example, is deemed essential, but um, I think, you know, like two thirds or more, more than two thirds of the U S workforce or worldwide workforce right now is working remote. So. Yeah, it's, it's just a lot different. My, my, my mom does uh healthcare stuff for Alina. She's not like in a hospital or anything, but she does like a lot of the billing and like, you know, technical organizational stuff. And, uh, yeah, they're, they're really busy. Turns out it's a, it's a very busy time to get everything updated in the systems, add tests, add equipment, add rooms, add beds, add everything. Yeah. It's a lot of change in a short amount of time. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh, it happened in such a short amount of time, um, despite knowing about it for, you know, months ahead of it, but Yeah. Right. Well, I hope we have better news on this front the next time we chat. Um, shall we continue on down our list? Let's do it. Yeah, I thought I would just highlight real quick um site that I've been using for all my my latest numbers is the ncove2019.live site, uh, started by um, a high schooler out of uh, Washington and then helped with uh, another developer um, – who helps work on it as well. So I thought that was a cool uh, story of independent people coming out to try to improve the the news and gathering of data around the whole pandemic. Anyway, so yeah, I linked their Twitters. I followed them. Nice. Anywho, all right, should we shift, shift gears? Yes, go for it. Cool. So I don't know if I've hinted at this or not in previous episodes, but um, last December... Um, and then through like a month ago, basically, um, I was working on refactoring the React placeholder library. Um, it's a React component library that shows text rows and blocks and shapes for um, kind of, you know how like on Facebook, if you use Facebook, um, you load it and it kind of shows the shimmering uh, filled boxes of what posts would be like, you know, there's a a row of color where a text would be once it loads and a circle where the profile image is, that kind of stuff. 
So it's that idea of a placeholder. So kind of building out your UI before the tech, the, the content has loaded. Um, so things don't flash around as much. Anyway, I use this at work quite a lot and, um, it, uh, was supported by React 0.14 through 16. So, um, it used some legacy component lifecycle methods and things, and it was throwing a lot of warnings in my console. So I'm like, Hey, let's rewrite it with hooks. So, uh, I went around starting updating a bunch of tests or adding tests before even refactoring back in December, um, updated the placeholder components to function components, removed prop types, and then went through and updated the um, class, the main class component to use um, hooks and effects for updating. So I finished that up, PR'd it. It was released as version 4.0, and then a small bug fixed at 4.0.1. So my latest open source adventure uh, continues, I guess. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to help maintain this as time goes on because it seems like a fun thing to work on so yeah cool yeah it's pretty fun yeah and uh, brandon helped me a little bit with this about um like isomorphic typescript prop interfaces um yeah that's right yeah that was that was a little while ago but um i don't know <laughs> so it seems to work for me at my job but uh it's a bit of a drastic change from what was there so i'm hoping it Work. No one's released or added issues or things. I'm I'm not sure how many people actually use this because, um, it is kind of an older library. Um, you know, it's a few years old at least. So I don't know if um, people are. It's like old old stars or whatnot. I guess I can look on npm to see download yeah, stats. Right, tw- twenty two thousand or so weekly downloads. Okay. Um, and, and you know, like if you did just bump from three to four, there might be a lot of leg laggards. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Right. Oh, I would totally expect so. Uh, but, you know, once you add TypeScript to something, it just gets so much better. So they should upgrade soon. Well, it had TypeScript before, um, but now they just think the, the prop interface is, Good. Uh, instead of a little more loose, it's a little more strict, um, hopefully for the best. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to go through and like uplift some tooling and use Babel to compile TypeScript and things mm-hmm. like that. It's using uh, a setup... I messaged um, the 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 person who kind of approved it and merged it and released it, um, and they were saying that the original creator no longer works at the company, um, so they don't really have anyone like fully dedicated to this library. So sure, um, they were happy that I was able to jump in, so they can kind of like facilitate things, but don't really have the time to dedicate towards it. So that's cool. We'll see nice. what I come up with in terms of stuff to do with it. I don't know. Maybe maybe we'll do something. Maybe not. Anywho. That's React Placeholder. Well, do you want to talk about where React Placeholder gets hosted? Yes, NPM. NPM, I think you mean GitHub, but I think you also mean Microsoft. Oh, man. Oh, Whoa. no. Um, hey, Brandon, what happened here? Yeah, so uh, a while back, uh, a week ago, or as we call it, in uh, on, on this on this side of uh, the time warp, five years ago, yeah. <laughs> uh, npm was uh, was bought by GitHub, and of course GitHub is owned by Microsoft. So this is just kind of another one of those things where uh, you know Microsoft seems to be controlling a lot of tooling that we use to build stuff, from VS Code to TypeScript to some seats on uh, the committee that creates the standard that is implemented as javascript by browsers um they're all over the gosh darn place uh so that's something so we thought last year when they bought github like oh boy that's a that's a thing but but now they're even they're going even further right it's a little maybe disconcerting i feel like but npm was already on a weird trajectory for quite some time uh there was a big kind of kerfuffle a while back about how there was some like hr stuff that had gone on where like somebody had this is some folks that invested in the company they kind of took it over and they installed a new ceo and some major founders both the founders left i think that's true that almost sounds true well, they had a bunch of layoffs a little bit ago too right yeah and a bunch more really important people um uh, who had been with the company for a long time had left high, high level folks in addition to folks being laid off. Um, so it just felt like a weird 
as an outsider, it felt like a weird state for such a critical piece of infrastructure to be in. Um, so I guess that it's backed by Microsoft now that adds a little bit of stability in my mind where it seems like, well, at least, you know, they're not going to run out of money and they're not going to be asking other people for money. So I guess that's kind of nice, I guess, maybe who knows? Well, right. Let's find out. And I think they're going to be asking you for lock-in instead, but it's a right. That's the trade off different price to pay, I guess. Um, yeah. I thought it was interesting with the messaging for this like acquisition. Like it's not Microsoft buying NPM. It's, github buying npm right uh and and it's interesting too that github has its own sort of you know package thing like their own packaging tool that they announced sometime last year that i haven't really seen anybody actually use but it's out there right and they explicitly mention in the post that they're going to be moving npm enterprise customers to github packages which i thought was interesting yeah, I think it reduces the number of options, but it pushes more people to go into GitHub. Well, because GitHub packages is kind of to compete with something like Artifactory, right? That can host yeah. Docker containers is, and NPM. And... Yeah, which is interesting because that, yeah, like Artifactory is a very expensive, very enterprise thing, yeah. Because yeah, that's what I'm I'm familiar with for private hosting. Um, yep. But I think I think GitHub is a good company to, to buy NPM. Um, I think they've in general, done a pretty good job about um, doing what's right for the community and reacting to what uh, the community wants and things. I think particularly since GitHub bought them, they've done a lot of enhancements, or since Microsoft bought them, a lot of enhancements that for a long time, GitHub kind of had worse features or or more limited stuff compared to something like GitLab. Um, I just see like, you know, they're updating their notifications. Um, They've... uh, added GitHub Actions, a lot of that kind of built-in stuff has really gotten better. And I think a company like Microsoft funding and owning them, you know, bettering the entire community at large. Um, well, of course, charging Enterprise for those pro features as well. I think that kind of moves everything forward more. Um, so I think, I personally think GitHub is a good company to buy NPM. Um, and it's nice that it's GitHub, not Microsoft buying them, because it kind of shows that it rolls up through GitHub. So there's a little buffer before it's just pure Microsoft down all the way. Right. Yeah, it's it's not uh, Azure package manager. Yeah. Oh, no. That would be quite a world. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see. Yep. Um, so the other thing that I think that could come out of this, and I kind of hope that it does, is sort of a, a new exploration in decentralized package management. You know, we, we do often pull all of our stuff from GitHub, or 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 more downstream npm itself and that's fun and all but it would be nice to not necessarily have to rely on one company's entire infrastructure to make it work right yep so we'll see it's interesting too that uh nobody was really outraged by this like people were very uh spooked when microsoft bought github Nobody really cares about this whatsoever. Like people jump ship and went to GitLab and you know did all sorts of stuff. This is just like no, nah, no, nah, this is fine. No, pro- no big deal. Well, I think uh, some of that is so many people use GitHub, where npm is just JavaScript developers. So um, as long as the registry stays up, it's kind of and I don't think anyone's worried that that registry is going to go down because everything depends on it. So. As long as that stays up, it doesn't really matter. It, I think it kind of means that no one was using NPM Enterprise or any of that stuff. So it doesn't really affect anyone super personally as long as the registry stays up. Yeah. So from that point of view, it's like, okay, sure. Great. Cool. Wonderful. Okay, now, Brandon, you can do the transition. Go. All right. Hey, Ryan. Uh, I know hey. I know you like Tailwind CSS, and I like Tailwind CSS. Did you uh, did you do anything with Tailwind CSS recently that's worth uh, talking about? I sure did. Uh, about, um, you know, it's funny how time flies, right? Like you, you mentioned earlier, like we're on this side of the time warp where a week is five years. Yeah. So about seven years ago, time warp time. Sure. Uh, which is four weeks ago, in other words. I um, rewrote a, you know, medium-sized little, like, mobile application. Uh, You know, it's mobile-responsive web Uh app kind of thing. So, not like React Native, but more like just React. And uh, it had been designed with no in particular framework in mind, uh, CSS-wise. 
and uh, you know, it sort of just developed over the course of a couple months, just on and off. Well, we 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 were trying to make it go live, and and it turns out you should have sort of a cohesive design and theme and style for it. Uh, and I I rewrote the whole entire web app in five days, front end and back end. Probably took me two and a half days for the front end and two and a half days for the back end. So pretty pretty even split there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I used Tailwind to do that front end design. And uh, I think this was my first time using Tailwind for something larger than just playing with it. And wow, it's uh, pretty close to fantastic. Right. <laughs> uh, so really, really fast to use, um, really easy to integrate with v- VS Code. There's a really nice little plugin that reads your CSS file, basically, or or it reads your config file so that it can enum all of the different, you know, class names which is really nice yeah and it's very predictable so you don't have to guess like is this thing called the nav bar is this thing called the nav bar lg black i don't know it's something i have to go read the docs again so you 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 do come up to this wall where you're like what are all the classes that tailwind offers but once you climb that wall that first day or so you're fine like you don't have to worry about what the classes are called, and you have the VS Code helper. It's not a big deal anymore. And for me, not having to fight with componentness is a big deal. So when you're designing your, I don't know, like little card element, like what is this thing's name? Okay, well, so I have a card. I have the card header. I have the card body. Why do I care what those things are called? Like, I don't. So I can give I can give a thing a name that means something in some specific contest or context, and then I can try to make some styles for it, or I can just give it styles. Um, because what I th- have been thinking about a lot is, especially after having done all of this, that the componentness of something is often very orthogonal to its style in a overall design. Uh huh. So I think of props and state being for data for doing something, and I think of style as being how it looks. Like those are different things. And sure, you know, if your shopping cart is too full, make it red. But like, it doesn't matter how you make it red. That's a, like a logical condition, and you just apply other classes for it. You don't need a name for that necessarily. Right. And that's been a big productivity increase and tailwind really makes that slick like it's it's really good so for some of that um switching between styles are you using something like the class names library or like conditionally just adding one class or another yeah so with tailwind you cannot make dynamic classes so for example let's say um you wanted to change the text color of something from green to red based on whatever condition so in regular react with your own styles, you could make it so that you return, you, like you have a function, and your function returns, you know, something based on this conditional, but it's only returning the middle part of a class. So, like text, variable color, red or green. Uh, Tailwind won't let you do that because you have to use purge CSS. Which means that it regexes us through all of your source code to find all of the class names used to keep them, to whitelist them. Oh, interesting. So you you can't have dynamic classes, but in a way, following the spirit of what we're trying to achieve with TypeScript, which is to make your code a tiny little bit, maybe a lot more verbose, but to give it some compile time predictability. So... What you end up doing is you make a map between whatever logical conditions you want and whatever your styles are, whatever your class styles are supposed to be. Uh, so they're ne- they're never dynamic; they're always fixed, known at time. And I use class names for that, and it works great. So as long as it's a string that it can be regexed in just through like searching through files, it's fine. So as long yep. as it's in its yep. complete, works great. Exactly. It has to be in its complete form with no concatenation or weird, you know, transclusion. Does that stuff. include things like uh, property on an object if you're using the, the object syntax for class names? Or does it, like, is it going through an AST of just strings or is it, uh, is, 
It is literally doing a regex. Wonderful. Keeps it easy. <laughs> it, is, it is really easy, and it works really well. Now, d- is that perfect? No, obviously not. Um, it's good enough for the, like, 80% of use cases when designing something fast. And that seems kind of where Tailwind really excels, um, that fastness. So this seems very similar to something like style equals on all your stuff, with the exception of it's more describing what it should be. So it's 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 a little less verbose because you can just say flex instead of display colon flex. Um, yep. But also things like, uh, you have an example here, bg dash blue dash green dash 300 that's probably setting a background to a certain color and um you don't have to remember those colors so you're you're like you know variables as class names which is kind of how css classes work so it's like it's getting closer to the the old school ways of style attributes but not quite well so one of the things that i hadn't uh hadn't occurred to me before that i recently was just reading about so i'm sure we've talked here on this show about design systems have, mm-hmm. have we have we ever talked about those from time to time a little bit yeah <laughs> so in design systems there's this concept of a design token or or uh, some kind of piece of code that can be moved through the pipeline so maybe it's like you enumerate all your colors and you give them names and you enumerate all of your margin spaces and you enumerate all of your padding spaces and you enumerate your line heights and you enumerate your heading sizes and so on. So I always thought about those design tokens as being things that you use to generate other code. But what somebody pointed out with Tailwind is all of those classes that Tailwind generates for you to use – those are the design tokens. Those are the tokens. Each individual atomic token is a token. Yep. And that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about it that way. And what's really cool about that is, so in a way, it's like putting you know an inline style on all of your elements. Yes, it is like that. But it is a restricted set of those possible styles. So you cannot just put in any random color. You are inclined to use a discrete and known at compile time token from your Tailwind's class set. It's really nice. And that gives you some security and safety for um, applying random stuff. And then, oops, you don't want it anymore. You have to find everything and know how you did it. You can refactor things and do theming a lot better. Exactly. Now, that's not to say that you don't have to write some custom CSS sometimes. I had to write some custom CSS for some animations. Mm -hmm. There's not like, uh, like if you want to have a squiggly animation for something, you have to kind of just write it yourself. Like it's not going to be out of the box. Uh, For whatever reason, there is no column, CSS column rules in Tailwind. I had to just write those myself. No big deal. But for the most part, you get so much good stuff just out of the box. It's easy to kind of jumpstart and go. Nice. Yeah, it seems like a cool framework. I haven't I haven't used it, but I've seen you two talk about it a lot lately. So. Yep, still pushing for it. Tailwind it up. Yeah, I'm using it on two projects right now, um, and a third like super duper uber side project that is now totally on the back burner because nobody's going anywhere. So I can't use the location based aspect of it. But um, the Tailwind, uh, I, th- I think like the developer experience of Tailwind is really interesting. Now, I've, I, I had a conversation with somebody in a Slack group a while back where somebody was very upset about Tailwind because they thought it violated like the quote unquote separation of concerns between like, H- you know, HTML should be an HTML file, CSS should be in a CSS file, JS should be in a JS file. And it's like, well, yeah. I, I I and I think it's interesting you bring up the design tokens argument for it because I that was the thing I was trying to get to but this dude just wasn't having it but he's kind of yeah. a jerk anyhow so <laughs> who yeah, cares it's it's, yep. it's really interesting and it's uh it's 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 still an ongoing thing Tailwind has a lot of deficiencies in right. how do you make a reusable component and then share it with everybody that's uh, kind <laughs> of a mystery still in my opinion uh-huh. um because it isn't the um because tailwind itself isn't really created with javascript in mind it is almost purely css which means you don't get a lot of the luxury you get out of something using style components <laughs> ironically i have my entire website and other websites using a shared 
style components library now. I am not going to switch that out to Tailwind, despite it liking it a lot. But I would love to have some Tailwind-like experience with those. Right. Um, kind of reusable components. And so there's there's almost like a Tailwind++ plus plus sometime in the future. Uh, and I'm still doing a lot of research to find out what those things are. Yeah. Well, you can use Tailwind with styled components so long as you use the Babel macro to plop in the literal CSS for it, which is some dark magic that I think we've discussed perhaps on this podcast pre- previously. I, I think we discussed it over coffee, and it is black magic, it's, like the coffee. It's terrifying. It is terrifying. Babel macros. Yeah. I, you know, that that has to be, there's there has to be a line somewhere. And I think for me, that line is, I don't want, I don't want to use that macro again. I might use a different one, but I don't want to use that one. Just a little too sketchy for me. Anyhow, no, it's good to hear that you're like in Tailwind and it's uh It'll be interesting to see what, what happens. Have you checked out Tailwind UI at all? That's the paid uh, okay. UI framework yes. for it. Y- yes, I have. And I have still not purchased it. And I want to. And I should. And it is a. it looks to me like a good value for 250 bucks. You get all of these pre-composed styles and thingamabobs. Mm-hmm. Now, what's interesting about what I don't quite know about Tailwind UI is do they actually give you like a secret plugin to go and plug into Tailwind Generator? I don't know. If they do and they're actually giving you some source code to actually go and plug into the thing, that's slightly more novel than I thought it was. Um, I almost don't want to use it in that situation. But if they're literally just giving me pre-composed, ready to go and change out to whatever I want, but just giving me a base template, yeah, that is perfect. That is exactly what I want to give the money for. I do not want custom CSS being generated, though, for it. Yeah, I th- I think I'm with you there. Yeah, Tailwind UI, uh, super cool. Highly recommend looking at that. Uh, I think it'll be. It's interesting. Like in some ways, like I hate I hate that they have to monetize it. I know they've spent like nine months working on this thing. Monetizing it mm, kind of feels like a money grab because it should be a part of just. Oh, here's a demo on how to make a nav bar with Tailwind. Okay, here you go. I understand that from that perspective that in order to actually make any of the stuff you do have to get paid for it, but it's like, it's a balance of what should be included with core as educational material and what should be included as value add. Right. And as a contractor, I'm also concerned about licensing. Like, do I have to yeah. sell, if I if I were to use this or even try it out, would I have to sell clients on another $250 license every time? Which, yes, yeah. According to the license, that is what you would have to do. Neat. Well, you know, th- then that that's um, sometimes a hard sell for people. Sometimes it's not. Depends on the. Some people are really concerned about that. But if it saves you two hours of work, it's it pays for itself, right? right. Exactly. That's that's true. That's true. Some people just don't like to be. People would rather. Sometimes people would rather pay an individual than pay a fee for a service or for 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 a for a product. And some people are fine with paying fees for product if it decreases the amount they have to pay an individual on the topic of uh css things did you hear super side note bootstrap 5 is going to drop ie support i heard they were going to drop jquery and something else too yeah oh my gosh that is it's amazing probably means css grid based would i don't quote me on that that's just my hunch but yeah now do you think uh, do you think they're going to pull a Bootstrap 4 for Bootstrap 5 and come out with it, like, in 2030? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I saw a Reddit thread, and uh, a lot of people were like, oh, I'm still on Bootstrap 3, and that's that's me too. And It's crazy to be on Bootstrap 3 still, to be honest. Yeah, I uh, roll my own Flexbox for everything, and that's... Oof. So I, in my app at work, we we wanted to switch the spacing to be from 15 pixels for, like, row column padding to 16 so i imported the yeah. whole sas thing for just the nav uh just for the column stuff and we re- we redefine it three or four times for our different side nav states so it's all like auto flows but yeah it's a lot of floats and i'd love to use some grid or flexbox more but when you have to support ie 11 hopefully not too much longer yeah well microsoft supports it till 2025 so 
Oh, no. Uh, worst case, five years. Best case, Kill with fire. at least two or three, I think. Anyway. I'm confused. What does this Babel macro do for Tailwind? So, so what Tailwind does is... Oh, I guess you should click through... Maybe I linked the. Wrong I'm in Babel one. plugin Tailwind components right now, which is the one. Okay, it yeah. Calls. Uh, so basically, what this does is you you can use uh, 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 the classes from your Tailwind in your style component. Uh, style components require that you actually write like CSS, though. So what this is doing is it's based on whatever you pass in is transcluding the real style that would be equivalent. Oh, so it takes whatever class name that you put for Tailwind and it copies the CSS that that class has into the styled component? Yeah, exactly. Whoa. Does it do that through setting class name on a component or? I have no idea what it's doing internally, but it's spooky to say the least. It's very um, scary. And then you can you can see how it says that it works down below. Oh, I see. It's a template literal. Okay, so you do TW. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Whoa, that's cool. It's cool, but it's also super duper spooky. Um, since That's we're in template literals. like meta meta chat time, sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not including this in the episode, so yeah, you think you're not, but you almost certainly will because it's hilarious now. Um, uh, you're probably if you, right. <laughs> <laughs> if you're because because I'm just gonna just say it anyway. Um, the two things that I alluded to about having like future integration with Tailwind uh, is sort of the two things that I grayed out down here in the show notes uh which are theme ui and glaze so theme ui and glaze they have this concept of having just a like so you know jsx is like javascript html templating Uh so they made something they made a special prop in jsx called sx (laughs) style x i don't know and it basically lets you write inline styles that get uh you know minified out and blah 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 so it's it's just like style components but without the naming of style components mm. but then glaze goes a step further and gives you an enumerated list of things you can do in your sx prop that are all in theory typed and like look look aheadable through like vs code and stuff uh, and I don't know, like this whole, this whole thing is just, it's all just crazy. This is true. Like, just look at the syntax for glaze. Like, it's just madness. Dot, 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 SX, parentheses, squiggly bracket, picks four, color white, BG red. And that means something? Wow. Yeah, it's, uh, like, object and default inheritance stuff. Weird. And then cool. it. And then it says that it maps themed values to statically generated class names. If that fails, though, an inline style will get applied as a fallback. Oh. Hmm. Yeah, I know. It's 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 crazy. So I'm still still doing the research on that. It's uh it's pretty intense. Hey, Brandon, I heard you're doing some React Native. Yes. Uh so I I mentioned that work's been a little bit weird. Um I've actually mostly been doing more of it um and a lot of that has come from a couple of new react native projects have spun up uh which is uh somewhat a somewhat surprising development um lots of kind of interesting um stuff that uses lots of sensors and cameras and things like that um so uh i it's been kind of interesting to set react native down for basically a year and then come back to it um spending most of the intervening year doing like hard hardware stuff and with node or um hybrid mobile app stuff but with flutter and not react native and i uh, i got to finally play with all the cool stuff uh with like auto linking um and uh so, so you no longer have to run react native link in order to get native modules um connected to your project mostly doing it automatically through coca pods which is pretty pretty legit um and the other thing that's been really substantial is like hot reloading and debugging which used to just like slow to a halt uh, in earlier versions of React Native, even on projects started as recently as like last year. Um, I, it must be all the stuff that Dan Abramov was working on um, because uh, it's pretty it's pretty darn slick. The new hot reloading experience, the new debugging experience is like 
on par with Flutter, which I would not have said a year ago. A year ago, I would have said Flutter has has the edge, but it's gotten a lot better. So it's it's really interesting. Um, another thing that I've uh, I've been kind of keeping in the back of my mind because I know a lot of people like Material UI. I'm not a big fan of Material UI. However, um, there is uh, there's an interesting uh, Material UI implementation called uh, React Native Paper that's done by the folks at Callstack. Um, that I've been using on a recent project, and I've I found that to be pretty pretty legit as well. Um, a lot of what it does is actually exports components that are named like React Native components, and a little bit less so like Material Design components or Material UI components. If you're familiar with the React Material UI library, um, but uh, they've done a really good job of matching up to what Material libraries look like on the web. Um, so I've been pretty pre- pleasantly surprised with that. But overall, it's been kind of interesting to see just how much better React Native has gotten. And yet, uh, you know, it's still pretty experimental. Um, it's just a, lo- a lot of pain points have been addressed, but there's uh, a lot left to go. And even as recently as past couple of days, people I've been talking to about React Native projects have been kind of dissuading them from using it because React Native is still React Native at the end of the day. Um, still lots of rough patches around native modules, um, you know, differences across iOS and Android, um, lots of long running issues in, in, in some pretty, um, core packages, even as core packages have been broken out from the actual react native project. So, um, it's been interesting. Ryan, do you think you'll go back to react native anytime soon or are you still doing react native stuff? Yeah, so I don't I don't have any current projects with React Native right now. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I was working on sort of a mobile responsive web app, and it was a web app because we didn't necessarily need to go through the whole React Native, you know, line of work. Right. Um, it is it is clearly just more work to make a, a, a React Native app versus a web app, and it is even further more work to make a native app versus a React Native app. Right. Uh, all that being said, I will I will definitely go back to it. Um, I don't think I I personally don't trust Flutter because it's a Google controlled tech, and that's pretty close to super spooky for me. Uh, you know, Facebook being the controller of React Native is also spooky, but less spooky because they actually use it in stuff. Yeah, and maybe they're not using it in some of their high performance high visibility locations maybe they're just using it in their ad manager app that's that's still good enough for me that means it's important enough yep uh and i i do believe that you remember a few years ago when fiber was coming out and i ha. which turned into react 16 yep mm-hmm. i think there's a similarly large rewrite coming for react native and i don't think it's here yet and i think we will all be either super surprised or pleasantly disappointed about it when that comes. So, yeah, I'm not in the like React Native world at all, but I know 0.62 just got released like a week or two ago, and it has been a long time since 6.1 came out. And was that the version that added the uh, custom uh, JavaScript interpreter with it? Uh, I think that was 60. I could be wrong about that. It okay. might have been 61. Um, but yes, so they, on uh, on Android, um, they released a, um, a, a a different JavaScript engine called Hermes that they, that Facebook had created um, that's uh, much, much, much faster on Android. And to be clear, um, on iOS, it's still using JavaScript core, but JavaScript core is quite a bit faster on iOS than it is on Android anyhow. Um, and so now I, I haven't, I haven't built a react native app for Android yet since that has changed. Um, or at least not one that's, that uses the version that could use Hermes, but, um, based on what I saw at chain react last summer, it seems like the performance improvements are going to be pretty, pretty absurd. So that's pr- pretty great. So I think there's, you know, a couple things to note, like um, all of this hot module reloading stuff, all of the uh, JSC and Hermes stuff, and then um, all of the good linking stuff that's changed. That uh, those were kind of three tenants that folks were talking about at Chain React last year as like big leaps forward for. Um, 
for React Native. Another thing that's kind of been on my radar too is like what they what they're calling the Lean Core initiative. So that's getting a lot of stuff like navigation, um, date inputs. Um, there's a couple other big ones like uh, like WebView. I think WebView and Maps are uh, are two other things that have been brought under this like React Native community organization. Um, and so, some of them are things that came out of the React Native project, and others are community modules that have been adopted um, from other maintainers. But um, I think that initiative is going pretty well or pretty much wrapped now in terms of breaking stuff out of the main React Native project. Um, and those were kind of the main things that I remember hearing about at Chain React. But Ryan, what what do you think is going to come in the next uh, next like in this surprise? or pleasantly disappointing <laughs> release. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure, and that's why I said it that way. So yeah. I hope that it sets either the groundwork for a stable 1.0, or they just pull a React and say that it's React Native 7.2 or something. <laughs> uh, I, I'm hoping what it ends up being is all of the things you just talked about, plus the mutual understanding that Yes, we're going to keep it around, and yes, there are some bugs, but yes, here's here it is, and it's pretty good. Um, it also could possibly coincide with changes on iOS because I think that's a that's one of their that's obviously a limitation in the ecosystem. Uh -huh. And if iOS is more permissive in how it treats browsers and embedding the browser and so on, I think there would be um, some pretty drastic changes there. Uh -huh. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. And for sure, you'll hear me talking about this on the show uh, for the foreseeable future because uh, lots more React Native. It's it's happening. It's back. I found a thread from somebody named Dan Abramov. I think he maybe might work at Facebook. I don't really know. Really? Uh, and, it, and it says here... Um, can I find out when this was posted? Why would that be an easy thing to do? March 3rd, 2020. Now, do you know if that was this year or last year? I'm pretty sure that was at least 10 years ago. Yeah, I was in high school. Okay. So it's, yeah, I, I'm not sure either. Okay. So what d this guy that, that's named Dan Abramov said. I've heard of him. Is Facebook's investment in React Native is as high as ever. The main app has 750 React Native screens, Oof. and it's used for several standalone apps. It's not the right trade-off for Messenger, the thing that was changed here. But the ethos of React Native inspires a lot of ongoing work. Cool. Great. I think it's going to stick around for a while. Yeah, hope so. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's been a big like force multiplier for me as a developer, so... Um, Absolutely. You know, I'm I'm... I owe a lot of my career to the fact that React Native exists. So, um, yeah, hopefully it, uh, I, you know, I have to imagine this is that you're absolutely right. And this, uh, this Dan person who we all know and love, uh, Dan, Dan probably is, uh, you know, not wrong, not wrong at all. He's, he's got better info than, is. than anybody else. Yeah. I think, uh, I, I think that's probably a good, good way to put it. Uh, cool. Well, I think it's about that time then. Uh, new Twitter followees, yeah. anybody? Hey. Yay! Cool. Well, for me, uh, I started by following the CodePen meetup, uh, which is uh, a run in town here um, uh, by an awesome person by the name of Andrea Edstrom, who Brian's going to be talking about later because I see that Andrea is on your list of Twitter followees. Um, the CodePen meetup in Twin Cities uh, used to be hosted at NPR or at a APM owned building. And now I think because nobody's having meetings at buildings anymore, uh, it's gone global and is um, hosted on Zoom. So that's pretty cool. Um, I've got my tickets for the next one, which is going to be on April 19th. I'm super excited. I have to get back into CodePen and I'm going to try to, you know, one of the one of my priorities for like professional development while we're all indoors is like I want to refocus on some like design skills that have been kind of lacking as I've been focusing more on, as like a data data side engineer um so as part of that i'm going to try to reinvest in a lot of stuff that i have maybe set aside and hopefully that'll be the sort of thing i have to learn from other people and also maybe demo some stuff at the next code pen meetup so when you when you use code pen do you ever feel limited that it doesn't have like a react environment completely set up for you ready to go that has been a little frustrating sometimes yeah but you know what okay just checking yeah, gotta get down to your roots and just write 
raw native vanilla JS. Yep. I, I, I thought you were going to say HTML, but okay. That too. Well, yeah, that, that too. Um, my other Twitter followee for this month is uh, Bellingcat, which is a uh, like data journalism, uh, public interest journalism thing that has done a bunch of stuff in, in concert with other news organizations like Al Jazeera. I think they did some stuff with um, b- 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 public something or other that I always forget the name of. Basically, they, they do lots of stuff with other news organizations, but they kind of act as like a data journalism uh, offshoot for it. It's kind of an interesting collective. So you can look, uh, it, it's just been interesting, especially in a time where, um, in, in a situation where data journalism is kind of maybe more important than ever or differently important, um, to how it's been important in the past. Um, I've, it's kind of been interesting to see their approach. Basically they do a lot of interesting, data journalism stuff in collaborations with other organizations. Yeah, here we go. The coronavirus di- disinformation system and how it works. Um, I think that was kind of an interesting um, example of their work. Oh, I also followed one of the folks who works under the name Bellingcat, who is uh, uh, who is on there, but I'm not going to add his personal one because uh, you may as well just follow the whole, the whole darn crew. Cool. Um, I'll go next. I followed a few people, but I'll just talk about two here. First is Mayer Lee. Uh, they're a uh, organizer of Minneapolis Junior Devs. Uh, maybe outgoing organizer. I'm not quite sure. Um, Brandon might know more about all that. Um, yeah, I went to Minneapolis Junior Devs in earlier in March, you know, years ago. Um, saw a great talk by Dakota Sexton um, about um, like uh, using frame or motion and doing um, nice animations and interaction design in the web. Um, and yeah, uh, followed a few people on Twitter from that event, including my early. Uh, the other person I followed is Andy Ad- Andrea Edstrom, as Brandon mentioned before. Um, I attended the March Code Pen, Code Pen meetup. I think it had only been, it was like a couple times a year in person. Um, and now it's kind of shifting to monthly on Zoom. So I... I joined a um, couple, or geez, was that just a week? I think it was just a week <laughs> ago. <laughs> um, yeah, there were like five or six of us. Um, I happen to know everyone there except for Andrea Edstrom. So uh, I followed her and the CodePen meetup as well. Um, I created a CodePen account while uh, at dur- uh, joining that meetup. So um, yeah, I'd like to get into some Canvas stuff, kind of inspired by Ryan's website background with the Canvas Whoa. stuff. Nice. Uh, I'm going to go for something, maybe not interactive, but, uh, something in the background, some line art or something. I'm not really sure. So I'm going to do that on CodePen. Um, I want to get something built by the next CodePen meetup so I can share it. But yes, if that sounds interesting, follow the Twitter account and RSVP on Eventbrite. It'll be, it'll be great. Cool. What about you, Ryan? I, I followed a couple people here. I will go in the opposite order of what's listed. Um... I followed somebody named Jason Miller uh, because he apparently created Preact, which is pretty cool. Uh, and I think I just saw his tweets and I thought I should give him a follow. I believe he works at Google right now and, um, you know, does web stuff sometimes, occasionally. It's always good to follow somebody who writes code. I think he also has a dog. <laughs> solid, solid overview there. I like it. Uh, and then I also followed Tim Walls. Does anybody know who that is? Uh, I think he's uh, the governor. Yeah. Yeah. So in the past um, couple of years, uh, I've been watching his um, daily press conferences that he'll have. Um, and he is a really good uh, speaker for the most part. And he's very articulate, precise, uh, responds to questions well without dodging them for no reason at all. Uh, just just uh, unusually good at what he is supposed to actually be doing. Yep. So I follow him on Twitter. Nice. Yeah. Have you all been watching his uh, 2 p.m.? Uh, yeah. Yes. I watched, I've watched one or two, not too many. It's, it cuts it on my uh, small window of productivity every day. So I see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'll usually have that on, on the weekdays in the background. Cause I'll just listen to the radio all day. Uh, if I'm not on a call. So, yeah, it's it's been it's interesting. It's good to have somebody like him in that position. 
Um, Minnesota's overall been pretty good about that for the past, you know, for the Mark Dayton era and, and, um, you know, clearly now. Um, so it's, it's good. It's nice to have competent people in charge of government and public health in, in the state, at least when we can't have it nationally. Yep, for sure. So while you've been listening to the radio in the background, I've been listening to an ungodly amount of music. So I use Last FM here. I'll link my profile because uh, got to plug Last FM. Um, my like weekly listening stats surged with this whole working from home thing. Um, yeah, I think I had my highest week of scrabbles uh, so far. So yeah, music going all the time. Nice. I ha- yeah, I haven't looked at last week's stats. I must. Oh, the weekend album came out. That's that's what I listened to a few times. <laughs> do you, do you know why his um do you know why his nose was bloody on SNL? I do not. Like what's that? No. What's that about? No. Okay. I'm not sure. I was wondering about that. It seems like something that is clearly a bit, but I don't know what I I don't understand the bit, which I think just means I'm an old person. Yeah, his music video for Heartless had him stumbling around a little bit too. So I'm not quite sure. I, I listened to the album many times through, but, um, I like his more like hip hop kind of style. So I'm like, you know, I'm on more of that edge of the spectrum. So a lot of this is, um, more the R and B kind of stuff, but yeah. Anyway, I'm looking out for remixes well, of his album. So you you linked me to this nice website with a lot of nice charts. So what did I have to do but look at the source code? It's an old site. The uh, They're using high charts for a lot of the things. Okay. But this weird radial circle one, li- the listening clock, yeah. that's an SVGJS instead. And there are bugs in Safari. I don't know. If uh, well, yeah. I mean, it's Safari. You hover that's over nice. it. Yeah. Oh, man. It mostly works, but it's a little bit. You can see that I... I'm up late and listen to music. I mean, look at this crazy tag timeline thing. This, well, I don't know what it's trying to tell me, but it is crazy. Oh, ta- uh, I got it. There was a problem loading your data. Please try again later. I think I've seen that. That's the genres, right? Yeah. Like the weekend gets their own genre. But yeah. And they're and like Dutch, Dutch genre or tag came up for a week and then disappeared. Mm. Anyway. Yeah. That's funny. I like last FM shout out to them. Yeah, I might start using that too because it would be good to keep track of that stuff and get stats in a way that Apple Music doesn't always let me. So, yeah, I use the Last.fm Scrobbler on my Macs um, and then mm-hmm. Spotify can auto-scrobble to Last.fm. So it's it's the only place that aggregates both services together that I've found. Hmm. Um, now, what is defined as the artist is different between Spotify and Apple Music. Um, hmm. Spotify seems to tag the artist as the main artist where Apple music, if the artist is like, uh, one person ampersand, another person that is counting as a completely different artist. And so there's, of course it is. So like the amount of artists I listen to, which it says since August 30th, 2011 is 8,656 artists. You know, it's probably hmm. a thousand less if you count, if you remove all those, you know, or a couple thousand less if you count all those shared collabs and things. Yeah, and then like you know, songs that have feature in it come from Apple Music, but ones that don't are often from Spotify, and so there's a lot of duplicate stuff that comes through as different songs. But anyway, sorry, that's Last FM. That's what I'm doing next time. <laughs> nice, nice. And this time, yes. What do you guys have coming up? I have a lot of working from home. I think that's all we can do now. Yep. Lots of that. Um, you know, I I, I bought uh, I bought my Mazda last year in, in September, and I um, you know I don't get to drive it around a lot these days, so I might just go for a drive sometime. Yeah, I was gonna say I I think I'm probably gonna go for a drive. I'm trying to like rather than get groceries from like grocery stores. Wow, that sounds strange. Um, I'm gonna try to like do more CSA stuff, yeah. small producers stuff like that if I can. Um. So, and most of those are out, you know, in the North Metro and stuff like that. So lots of fun little drives for essential things that otherwise, you know, you might usually get at, you know, big box stores a mile from, from my place. If you do go for a drive, I do, I I should, I should mention that I I did pick up some stuff from the office uh, about a week and a half ago and 
the drivers that were out there at that time, even though everybody hadn't been ordered to shelter in place at that time, there was a lot less drivers out there, but they were all insane. Uh, you probably shouldn't go 70 and 94, it turns out. Oof. Yeah, that's, um, that's not... Well, as a rule, I just never take 94 if I can avoid it. True. Because 94 is the one of the worst roadways in the Ever. state of Minnesota. Yeah, and prob- probably the worst. Uh, 394 and 494 are, you know, right there, right there on that list. 694 I can usually handle. It's 494 and 394 that just make me very sad. Also, Highway 100. Highway 100 is terrible. So pretty much everything in the lower left. So yeah, just keep <laughs> listing them off. I, yeah, I, I don't, I, I don't believe that anything south of south of 94 or um, west of like 35W exists. I yeah, just that's, don't. That's fair. I've been there, but I'm pretty sure it's a Twilight Zone where everything is terrible <laughs> and um, and nothing. So, sorry. Brian, I know that's, I know that's, uh, uh, you know, parts for the most part, Minneapolis is accepted from that. It's just, um, Hey, I'm, I'm with you hundred percent. I hate driving to the suburbs city for life. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So if you do go anywhere, just be careful because there are a lot of crazy people out there driving around super fast and recklessly. Yep. Yep. Well, I, yeah, I don't know. I guess I haven't, have I, have I said what I'm doing next week? I don't know. Next week, next year, who knows? Um, mostly a lot of work, uh, lots of baking, lots of cooking, lots of food stuff. I think, um, I've got some cookbooks I'm trying to work through and I'm just trying to be a little bit more methodical about everything now that I can be, um, like it's, it's weird how all of a sudden I went from like two coffees a day out somewhere between one and two meals a day out to like no meals a day out and no coffees a day out. Everything, everything I eat, I make. So there you go. Pretty, pretty wild. Yeah. My, uh, visa bill is going to be the lowest it's been since like know. high school or college. It's wild. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I hope to bike over to United Noodle or something, just a, a different grocery store, pick up some, some more unique snacks and food things. Otherwise, yeah, working from home, going on walks. I went on a bike ride on Friday. That was really nice to get. It was the, I realized it was the first time I've gone faster than like four miles an hour in weeks. Nice. So that was that was good. Yeah, my car has been sitting for two weeks doing nothing. I saw gas as cheap as one fifty nine. Cheapers over on Lindale and thirty sixth. That BP station that's always cheap. Yeah, where can we find you all? Well, you can find me just about everywhere, but especially on Twitter at Ryan Martin, and of course on my website RyanRamperset dot com. Uh, you once were able to find me just about anywhere, but now you're mostly able to find me in one specific spot. Uh, which is Minneapolis and uh, also Twitter uh, where I'm Brandon underscore MN or Instagram if you like food stuff because uh, that's all my Instagram is. It's all food. Uh, how about you, Brian? You can find me at home in Uptown or on my website, brianm.me, which has a new uses page, which is basically taking my uh, Living, Docs's, Living Docs pages that were gear and software, merging them together, deleting some stuff and adding a photo of my desk. Nice. Uh so now I have a uses. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or on Instagram at Brian Mitch L where I t- uh, posted a photo of pizza that I made. I've made three pizzas in the last two weeks with my pizza stone and it's quite fun and delicious. Yeah, that's me. You can find the show notes for this episode at the nexus.tv slash PK 56. Uh, you can discuss this episode on our Twitter, which is twitter.com slash the nexus TV. Um, or on our subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash the nexus tv. And if you like what we're doing here, you can uh, head over to our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash the nexus tv, and support us as you are able. With that, have a good one. Have a good one. Have a good one. See you on the next episode. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.